As we wrestle with deep-rooted issues of social justice and inequality, it's plain to see that fairness is in short supply, but our next guest says it wasn't always the case. Kurt Anderson is a best-selling author and journalist. His latest book is Evil Geniuses, The Unmaking of America, A Recent History. And here he is talking to our Walter Isaacson about the dangers of America's hypercapitalism and the need to take a step back. Thank you, Christian. And Kurt Anderson, welcome to the show. Happy to be here. You know, your last book, Fantasyland, totally amazing. It's about conspiracy theories in America, all the way going back to the Salem witch trials, how that's part of our national character, sometimes to believe in fantasies. And now you're doing another book that is also about a conspiracy, but one you believe in. You kind of make note of that in the book. How did you move from Fantasyland to this book, Evil Geniuses? Well, uh, I moved from uh, really the, the the seeds of this book came out of the work, the research I was doing, Fantasyland. Fantasyland was a history of the last few hundred years, but a bunch of it was the last 50 years and, and how this uh, proliferation of magical thinking and delusion and our, our, our chronic American weakness for entertaining falsehoods came to undo us. But the other half of the story was what I realized after I finished that. So it was really, okay, how did the economics change? How did the politics change? How does technology work here? All the sort of hard aspects of how, how America drove into a ditch these last 50 years. So that, that set me on solving this. I mean, when I was, when I was out talking about Fantasyland, uh, uh, more than once, someone would say to me, well, you, you say that people deny cli climate change in America because of this, this history of not believing science and so forth. What about, what about the Koch brothers? And it got me thinking because they had a point, those readers, uh, which is to say, uh, yes, our, our magical thinking fantasy land America predisposed us to, to a lot of us to believe climate change isn't real, but it wouldn't have happened had we not had this orchestrated effort by the economic right, by the oil companies, by everybody to cast doubt on science. That's one of the one of the things, as you know, that I that I have in this book is this, these extraordinary memos from the American Petroleum Institute, from the pollster Frank Luntz, others saying, "Oh, we got to start casting doubt on science." That in the late eighties and nineties. Explain who the players are in this. Well, the the the, the kind of uh, one of the original players was uh, the Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman, who, who was just, had just become well known during the 60s. When anything goes, let's see what everybody has to say, even though he was still a bit on the fringes at the University of Chicago. But he wrote this extraordinary Friedman Doctrine uh, uh, pub, uh, essay that was published in, in the New York Times Magazine in 1970 saying, business people, Forget all this social responsibility stuff. Forget trying to improve the environment. Forget trying to be less racist. All of it, profits are all that matter. And it was kind of a, a liberating rallying cry for the, the, the kind of hunkered down CEOs and, and economic writers to come up. And, and so he's one. Uh, Lewis Powell, uh, again, a, a guy who was not a particularly amazing, charismatic, distinguished Supreme Court justice, but who just as a, as a big time lawyer in 1971, commissioned by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, wrote out this memo, this 40 some page memo laying out, here's what we have to do to take back the power for big business. Period. That's what he did. And, and because it was so successful within a dozen years or certainly a generation, it's amazing at how specifically what happened, build think tanks, take over the media, influence in universities, uh, uh, become seriously militant UCOs about lobbying for things in Washington, create more lobbying, change the judiciary. That's our big uh, option. He, it, was, it, it was like something in a, in, a, in a bad novel where, you know, oh, this is ridiculous. This is too on the nose. How much Lewis Powell's uh, memo in 1971 had it. There are other memos. There's one in 1980 that, again, funded by billionaires, a, a billionaire, Richard Mellon Scaife, to, to say, what do we need to do to make the law uh, friendly to our right-wing way of 
thinking economically. Well, this is what you need to do. And, and, and kaboom, Federalist Society is the, is the epitome of that recommendation. And a year later, it was created, and now it is the single most powerful kind of influencer of law and, and, and jurisprudence. Well, you talk about the 1980s being sort of a paradigm shift. Something happens then. What were we shifting from and what did we shift to? Well, you know, some of my leftier friends will uh, take issue with the fact when I say that, oh, you know, apart from sexism and racism, uh, uh, America economically, economically, America was working pretty well from, from World War II through almost 1980. We were getting more and more equal. 1976, by the so-called Gini coefficient, which measures inequality in any state or country or whatever, was the best it ever has been in America, and certainly better than it has been since. We were doing pretty well. All boats were rising. As productivity rose, so did median incomes. As economic growth increased, all boats rose together. Some poor, some rich, but all boats rose together. Um, and, well, or take CEO pay. It was 50 times the average CEO made than his or her, eh, probably not so much her back then, but made 50 times as much as the average employee. Then suddenly it was decided, not because it had been illegal, but just because the norms changed and greed is good as of the 1980s, the average CEO was making 200, 300, 500, today as much as a thousand times as much as his or her employee. That's, that's what happened. Because somehow we were, enough of us were hoodwinked to think, no, this is just the way it works. This is the free market. This is the way it's always been. But it wasn't the way it's always been. Through, through progressivism, through the New Deal, through both Roosevelt's, we, we put guardrails up and, and, and systems in place that made it work much better. And it was working much better until these guys hijacked it and made it work worse and made it work well only for the, for the relatively well-to-do or the extremely well-to-do. You say that you yourself was a useful idiot, and you have a wonderful section at the beginning of the book and excerpted some in The Atlantic that talks about how in the 1980s, 1990s, you were riding high, you were in part of the media world in New York, and you went along like most new Democrats and neoliberals did with this whole change. Uh, explain that to me and how you feel that that played into this paradigm shift we had in America. Once the, the the shift came this 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 conservative shift some of which some of which a bit of which was organic happened after the late 60s and early 70s but but these guys my evil geniuses took it you know took that slight pendulum swing that course correction and went off off road um so uh they they really changed the 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 whole way of of thinking through and and by so many means by setting up think tanks by giving money to universities by by changing our beliefs now our again i don't want to i don't want to grab you into my useful idiot uh uh cadre walter but but um there was a good faith effort by liberals by democrats of the gary hart kind of the bob Kerry kind of the bill bradley kind to say wait you know, we are a free market country and there's a lot of room for compromise with with the right, with free marketers. We were plagued, I, I think, and I've come to believe looking back at that, we were because the, the 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 economic right, and that's what this book is about. It's not so much about religious rightists or anti abortion people or it's 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 about the this this long game played so brilliantly by these by 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 big business, by by uh, right-wing ideologues, the rest, they they kept at it. And we, the new Democrats, said, yes, of course, there are market-based solutions. Oh, good, public-private uh, cooperation. Oh, good, yeah, sure. Let's, yeah, de someday regulation is good. And it was. But then it, it just, the, the, the center kept moving right. And, and, and there was no more, basically, no more economic left. And, and that's the problem, I think, because, because, we, many of us liberals, college educated people, were doing well in our professions and our jobs were not being offshored and not being outsourced and not being automated. And so we could afford to sort of take the long view and say, look, the industrial revolutions in the past have all worked out okay eventually. And, you know, it looks this time as if this is, this is different. 
But you say that a whole lot of Democrats, including Democratic presidents uh, like Bill Clinton, they became new Democrats and they kind of go along with this agenda. Well, they they help by standing down and not they're not being among in the Democratic Party, the Democratic coalition, much in the way of a a plausible, visionary, inspiring left alternative on the economy. Yeah, they, they fail. Uh, again, I I, in, I I wasn't a politician. I was just a lowly journalist. Um, but but I was again. I include myself in that mea culpa that that we because I mean I I wouldn't we were kind of bought off right. I mean I, I always rejected that idea. Oh, you mainstream corporate media types, you're just bought off. No 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 no. I, I I'm willing to tell the truth, and that's what we're, what I'm about is telling the truth. Yeah. But but our our I would say and there and and <laughs> Gary Hartz and others, indifference to the people suddenly out of work in the Rust Belt, and and all of the other losers in this changed go go, financialized, technological new economy, uh, the 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 callousness uh, was was wrong and 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 took many of them and us too long to recognize too many like two generations to recognize until until the 2000s really until the 2010s not that many national democrats were standing up and going mm, this is wrong and it's a systemic problem it, it's it's harder than it has probably ever been in america to rise up right from generation to generation and that didn't again it didn't just happen it happened as a result of all of these changes in, 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 in norms and laws and regulations that, that don't benefit, not just don't benefit the poor, don't benefit the middle, and don't even benefit the somewhat upper middle anymore. Uh, I'm going to read you something of a book that I think should be read as a companion to your evil geniuses. I know you've read it and you actually uh, cite Michael Sandel, the Harvard uh, professor. But Michael wrote, writes in his upcoming book, the elites who governed the United States from 1940 to 1980 were successful. They won World War II, they rebuilt Europe and Japan, they strengthened the welfare of state, dismantled segregation, and presided over four decades of economic growth that the rich and the poor both benefited from. By contrast, the elites, and he's talking about meritocratic elites, not just a right-wing conspiracy, who have governed since uh, the four days four decades since then, in other words, our time, have brought stagnant wages for most workers, inequalities of income, uh, wealth disparities not seen since the 1920s, the Iraq war, endless wars in Afghanistan, financial deregula deregulation, the decline of an infrastructure in our country, and a polarization uh, and poisoning of our politics that comes from things like you know, unlimited money in politics and gerrymandering. Yeah. So don't we want to get back to a time when we protected workers and had uh, more uh, just and fair distribution of the wealth of society? Absolutely we do. And that's why I spend so much time at the end of the, near the end of the book talking about the forms of nostalgia. Nostalgia is not all bad because nostalgia can also be, it's a big, broad brush. And looking at, well, look, not so long ago, when you and I were young people, America was fair economically, pretty fair. Uh, and, and yes, there was regulation. Yes, there was very high taxes on the wealthy and so on and so forth. And it worked well. And, and people got rich. And, pe and the middle class felt secure and was expanding. So that's not... So there are different kinds of nostalgia. There's 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 pointless nostalgia. We're not going to get be a big coal mining country again, and and we're not going to have uh, illegal segregation again, and we're not going to. So there are there are wrong and 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 useless and fantastical forms of nostalgia. Then there's well, let's look at our recent history and say like, wow, we were doing it much better. Let's at least get back to as doing it as well as we were doing it in 1976, and as and as well as other countries, our, our rich country peers are doing it now. So there's there, there's there's useless nostalgia and 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 dangerous and pathological nostalgia, and then there's looking at history, and those are two different things. Uh, uh, and 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 
And we have to be careful not to say, oh, everything in the past is in the past and it's no good. That's not true either. There, 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 are, just, there are parts of the past that we can look to uh, as models for the future. Yeah, but we have to remember that the past we're looking for as models was deeply segregated, had yes. great racial discrimination, and for that matter, discrimination against women and gays. Yep, absolutely. So, and that's the thing. I mean, that, that's why in so many ways, the 70s, we, we, were, we were beginning to address those issues, right? Uh, legally, you know, civil rights laws had happened. Uh, Title IX and, 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 very, and, and women's rights laws had happened. And, and we were getting economically more equal. All these different parts of progress were happening. Yes, you don't want to go back to the patriarchy and white supremacy of, of life before the modern times. But that doesn't mean that everything that was in place back then was terrible, because economically, it was much better. What has the pandemic exposed about the truth uh, about this country, and will it force a reckoning? Well, it, it, I don't know it will force a reckoning, but it certainly makes, to me, more naked this ruling paradigm of, of our version, our American version of hyper-capitalism and all that counts is money and all other values and, and communitarian ideas. Eh, nothing. It's all about the money, Jack. It's all about the stock market and the marketplace values in general. I think, I think the pandemic and the unnecessarily uh, failed response to it, driven by these various ideologies and instincts, will, we'll, I think, uh, have the job of, of, of at least convincing people like, yeah, this is screwed up and, and these, th these people do not have my uh, best interests or the public good at heart. So I think, I think it, I'm hopeful because I'm a hopeful, optimistic American that uh, this can be a moment for, for a reset, for a reckoning. Pick the word, but... Uh, you know, talk to me on November fourth, and I'll, you'll, I'll, I'll, I'll either be a hopeful American or, or uh, had some new stage of hopelessness that I've never experienced before. Kurt Anderson, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, it was totally my pleasure, Walter. Thank you.